My name is Joe Volpe, Joseph officially, but Joe Volpe is what most people know me by. And um, I started, I guess, in 1958 um, at RCA Morristown Division, Radar Division, and uh, came as a B engineer, as a matter of fact. Moved over from Minneapolis Honeywell Brown Instrument Division. And that was the beginning of a a long and interesting career, very varied, I might add, too. Most of which, if not not most, all of which took place in South Jersey, except for, if you want to call Princeton, South Jersey. That was the end of my career. Mm -hmm. um, could you just run through um, what was the first project you worked on and uh, what was it like coming to RCA? Well, for me, it was uh, quite a change. I had uh, spent all my career, such as it was, limited to that time, uh, from uh, a commercial environment, and I moved into uh, the Morristown uh, environment, which was all government sourcing, government uh, specifications, and government contracts. Uh, so that, uh, uh, and it was a very large environment. The, the group I worked with prior was like a five-person group in, inside of a, a large uh, research environment, which was 100 people. Got to Morristown, and we were talking in the thousands of people. I came in at the end of the Bemuse program, and uh, but I think the probably the main reason they hired me was that they were embarked on a uh, program that used a lot of analog equipment, recording equipment, similar to what I had been experiencing had the experience before at Honeywell. So uh, the first program was on the damp research ship, as a matter of fact. And uh, we were equipping it to, uh, so it could uh, work downstream of the missile firings that took off from Cape Canaveral at that time. And that was the beginning. And as a matter of fact, uh, it was interesting because since it was a radar division, the only thing I knew about radar when I joined RCA is that you could spell radar forwards and backwards the same way. And that was, so I had plenty to learn over the next years. Is there any particular event or um, recollection that you have of that first time as far as um, uh, some instance? Well, as I mentioned when we were talking informally before, when I first came to RCA, or prior to when I first came to RCA, um, I, I was n notified that I was hired, and then I noticed in the papers that uh, the engineers were on strike. Since I was an engineer, I was wondering what I was going to do when I got there, and I was informed by my supervisor to come in, get indoctrinated, get your physical, then you can go out on strike if you want to. Uh, but uh, other than that, and the other thing was, for the first six months, I remember I had to count on somebody going on vacation so I could get a desk. That's how overcrowded we were. Uh, it was a boom time, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was, it was very interesting. It was funny because being from the outside, from a totally different environment, it was very easy to get together and, and meet friends and, and meet engineers. It, it was an extremely friendly environment. That's the best I can describe. And uh, from that day on, I found out that that was probably a hallmark of working with RCA. Mm -hmm. It was a friendly environment. Okay. Did you have any mentors or anything when you first showed up? Oh, that's interesting. I have to think back now. You're really going back to ancient history. Um, it, it turned out that uh, one of the fellows who ter was my uh, supervisor at the time, uh, Dwayne Gunn, turned out to be a, a very good uh, friend throughout my career, and afterwards, so much so that I still continue uh, playing bridge with him. But uh, um, I'm trying to think of some other guys. There were mostly engineers, I guess, that I, I and administrators, a couple of administrators that were very, uh, and technicians. That's now that I'm starting to think, the technician was, was your right arm uh, to the engineers, particularly one, an engineer like myself who didn't know anything about radar. And uh, we had some very, very good engineers, uh, technicians that I got associated with. And um, later, as I'm starting to think now and recollect, 
I remember one particular engineer who we became friends to this day. As a matter of fact, I think he's still working there, uh, Dick Cooper. His wife runs the bridge club, so that's turned out to be an, a, an interesting coincidence. You mentioned the technicians. Is there anything that stands out in your mind, any story of where a technician was particularly useful to you? Well, yes. Um, one of the things that one of my first pro design projects was uh, working on integrated circuits, or at that time they were transistor circuits. And uh, there was a, a one particular technician who had some reasonable experience in that, as contrasted to myself, who had no experience in transistors at that time, except for one little circuit that I worked on in Honeywell. And he was a, a godsend. Matter of fact, he dug up a, uh, an in-house transistor course that one of the AA engineers used to put on for the uh, other engineers to get them indoctrinated into this new field of transistor electronics. And uh, I took, got a hold of a copy of that and worked the whole weekend and came in Monday as transistor expert. And that was the only thing I can think of. I can't think of his name. That's the unfortunate part about it. You, uh, you had a very impressive career at RCA. Could you just lead us through your, the progression of your career and uh, the projects and, and your responsibilities as they move through? Well, that may take a few more words than uh, you have enough recording for, but let's start. Came in as a B engineer, as I mentioned, and uh, the pay was so good that I was able to go from a leader back at Honeywell to a B engineer, which was practically the lowest level, just slightly above C, and still get an increase since that was an important part of my life, was earning enough money to support my family uh, more than anything else. So from, uh, and that was in design, and as I mentioned, design engineering, worked on the DAMP program, came back, and then sort of had a ho-hum uh, assignment working on Bemuse conversion. For some reason, they had to convert all the drawings from one format to another, and uh, it was a kind of a boring but well-paying job at the time. Um, I'm trying to remember, oh, I, I, the, um, somebody was on vacation, it turned out. That's a funny th thing, how incidences, circumstances. And it was Dick Cooper's um, companion engineer who was working on a radar down in the factory at the time. So I took his place and started working on my first radar, really, at that point. And uh, as a matter of fact, I remember the fellow's name who was on vacation, Dick Durham who at that time was a, uh, a union shop steward or something for the engineers. And from there, I continued to work on RCA on radars. And because I worked on that one radar, everybody thought I knew something about it. And my assignments seemed to keep coming along along that line. And that was an FPS 16 radar, which was one of RCA Moore Sound's bread and butter radars. Uh, worked on that a couple programs along that line in design engineering. And then I someone uh, offered me a job in projects, project engineering. And uh, well, project engineering was a, one of the three sections of engineering at that time. Well, not engineering, of the engineering community. Design, projects, and systems engineering they were kind of like the three havens for engineers to hang out. So I got started on um, MPS um, what was his number? I can't forget all the number, but FPQ-6, which is the MIPA radar. And I worked on as a project engineer, and from project engineer became a project leader, and continued to work on radars. And then from that one, it seemed like every time a program was in trouble, like the real-time telemetry program, it would go so far, and somehow or other, I would get assigned to be the, the tail end of that program, see if I could bring take it to its conclusion. And um, kept going along those lines with project management jobs. And I really enjoyed project engineering more than anything else. And, but I, at the same time, I always wanted to get, I was a, a promotion. I said, well, you, never, you did all these jobs, but you never took a job from beginning to end. So I said, okay, give me a job from beginning to end. And the MPS 36, which I just happened to look at, there's a final report in your archives there, which was very interesting. So I, I got that job, which was a development of a job of a radar, a mobile radar for the uh, White Sands uh, facility, and we took that program all the way through. It's from beginning to end, and got it 
signed off and got the production contract. So lo and behold, a week later, I, I got a promotion finally from leader to manager. I was very happy. And that lasted for about two weeks when all of a sudden my boss came down and says, um, we got a new job for you. What's that? He says, well, we want you to be project manager of the Aegis radar, just the radar, which was called MFAR at that time. I don't know if he kept the name of, I forget what the latest name is. It. So I went up there and all of a sudden became a project manager of the MFAR radar. And we were cranking along on that. And that was a very, very intense job. Um, I mean, it, we, we were involved in everything that you can imagine uh, in, associated with a, a uh, phased array radar. And uh, after a couple of years, I think it was about two years of that, the, uh, due to reorganizations and a number of, of um, things that happened, I was able to promote it to from the radar project manager to the whole Aegis project manager. There was project management and system engineering. And uh, that was under Bill Goodwin. And my companion was uh, Larry Shipper, who had the system engineer, and I had that. That was probably the most exciting part of my uh, radar experience because I had to get into things like that we were just sort of infancy then called software. <laughs> and we had a computer program that was the largest real-time program that I knew of at that time that was being developed as part of the Aegis program. Well, we cranked along on that, and uh, I spent my, most of my waking hours at, at Morristown doing that until we finally finished uh, the development phase of the program, and we were about to go into the uh, production phase. And uh, I was kind of getting bored, if you will, of that since that challenge was over. And the then project, uh, not project, but chief um, general manager of Morristown, uh, Max Lair said, uh, sit tight, I, got a, I think I may have another job for you. And lo and behold, two weeks later, he came and offered me a job as chief engineer. And I said, you got to be kidding. That was about the most improbable job in the world for me, especially since the chief engineer I was replacing was Dudley Kotler. And Dudley probably forgot more technology than I knew. And I said, I can't possibly take his place. Do you but, remember what year that was? Uh, well, let's see, 77, it was in around the 75, okay. that, that, around that time, 1975, because I think Aegis started actually in the late 69 and 70s, so it was about five years. Um, my, my years may be off because I started to get a little jumbled, but so I went in as chief engineer and uh, found, got my comfort zone up pretty fast and found out I wasn't going to be another Dudley Cotler, I was going to be a Joe Volpe. So uh, I did my thing there, and um, that was a fun type thing with a lot of engineers of all sizes and shapes, and, and uh, they, a lot of people I knew and uh, respected as well. And that's when I came over into the commercial business of RCA, which was the broadcast division. At first, part as the uh, uh, vice president of the antenna transmitter part of it, and then within about a year or two, again, another reorganization took over the whole broadcast division as a vice president general manager. And uh, cranked along very nicely for a, a couple of years. So we were struggling, but uh, we were sort of in the sh twilight of the broadcast division. Many of the highlights, uh, interesting things that happened in the beginning of broadcast happened before my time. But again, it was a challenge to try to keep this division going in. And uh, then I got a phone call one morning. It says, hey, we uh, sold Hertz, and we got a lot of money to put aside as a, uh, what they call those reserve accounts. So we want you to close the division down. So we proceeded and closed the division down and uh, moved on. Uh, and I moved on into a, what I used to call a, sort of a waiting spot. It was on staff, uh, as a staff uh, vice president, while they tried to find a job that I was interested in. And uh, if I'm going too far, just tell me. So that was a notable year or so that I spent on staff because at the end of that, towards the end of that year, uh, there was a company called GE that proceeded and suddenly purchased, unbelievably, RCA. And uh, that's, uh, that was probably a very close to my end of my uh, RCA career, but not quite, because 
I actually retired officially from RCA, and then the next week I went up to work for RCA Research Lab at Sarnoff, where, which had become an independent lab thanks to GE's uh, foresight and generosity, and they needed somebody up there to help them change over from being a corporate lab to earning their own keep. So I went up there as uh, vice president of marketing, of all things, something else I had never done be directly, officially. And I spent my last four years, I kind of think of it as even as still being RCA, although it wasn't, it was officially independent at the labs until I retired. And that's been almost 24, that's 24 years ago, right? Wow. That's, a, that's quite a career. Um, what was the best thing about working for RCA? I guess I enjoyed it. Uh, I enjoyed it uh, almost too much, <laughs> as my family would probably tell you, because I, I was a, became a workaholic many times during that period. But the reason I did, it was a workaholic is that I was enjoyed what I did. I, when you get up in the morning, I was looking forward to all, there could have been all kinds of problems, which there usually were, but I enjoyed working on problems and thinking of new ways of doing things and doing it in an environment where you liked it. Uh, and I think that uh, I, I'm not independent in that thought. Uh, most of the people I worked with, for, and uh, were that kind of people that you, you, you got along. It didn't matter whether you disagreed or were arguing. Yeah, engineering and projects always were arguing and discussing, but it still was enjoyable, it was fun. Um, and that, I think, was the thing that sticks out in my mind if I had it to do over again, I'd be glad to do it. Mm -hmm. Really would enjoy doing it. Well, what were your supervisors like? <laughs> supervisors? Well, you, we ha I had, like everybody, had my whole list of supervisors that uh, they were what I would consider good supervisors, bad supervisors, and whatever. But in general, you, you know, the thing you could, you, you could really deal with them, um, you never felt uncomfortable. Uh, Sometimes there was a closeness, sometimes a little farther uh, aloofness. But in general, I think that um, I'm just reflecting as I'm trying to answer you. Had some interesting experience with supervisors. I remember one his name was Anderson. Anderson was a very tall guy compared to me and uh, very uh, polished looking. And I remember working one night, all night, and I made this wonderful big presentation all in colored chalk of all the aspects of this proposal. I, the next morning I'm preparing to give it to him and I'm giving him all these facets which I highlighted with color and at the end of the presentation he says that was a wonderful presentation Joe but I have to tell you I'm colorblind. <laughs> so we had some interesting experiences like that and uh, some rather you know, unique ones. Take a guy like Max Lair uh, who didn't have any technical, well, any formal technical background. His, he was what we used to call a number cruncher in those days, but, and he became general manager. And yet, and he's running a highly technical organization, the radar organization, and yet as a leader and a manager, it was unbelievable how you could re, he could relate to what you were saying and, and direct it and provide guidance. Things like that that were good. I think that the... Uh, RCA that I knew was predominantly a very technically oriented uh, community. Uh, you kind of like felt it was run by engineers and, and uh, controlled by it, which is part of the reason I think that they weren't quite as successful as they should have been. They needed a few more businessmen that could uh, uh, put some of the technical stuff up, uh, away. Mm -hmm. uh, I think when I went up to the uh, RCA labs, Sarnoff labs, to give you a for instance, now, we spent there, before my time and during my time, tens of millions of dollars trying to uh, invent and perfect a solid screen, what we would call an LCD uh, TV. And, and uh, the millions and millions we were trying to make on a small thing like 4x4. Four four. And we never quite were there because we were always trying for perfection. Now you can buy a Samsung 
TV, which I just did, 55 inch, which is probably has more imperfections in it than we ever knew, but they're all taken care of uh, with circuitry. And the RCA engineer was, was the one to try to make it perfect. And the businessman over at Samsung said, hey, this is good enough. And that, that's why I guess we just sold, we just invented this stuff and somebody else made money on it. Yeah. Um, okay. Yes, Joe. I would like you to develop the concept of Aegis and one of the greatest programs for the nation, what it did for the nation, the, the Navy, essentially, and bring up the general All right, well, and so on. The Aegis program, <clears throat> although it was a government program and a Navy program, a contractual program, and all the rest of it, was rather unique in one major aspect that the uh, interface between the customer and the uh, the contractor was totally different than anything else I can imagine. And uh, I think that was because primarily of the leader on the Navy community, which at that time was Captain Myers, who happened to be Admiral Myers. And I uh, we did things totally different. And that used to cause me a lot of strain and pain at many times because I was of the old school, if you will, and Captain Meyer was a totally different type of person. But what, what it did is that we finally started out with a contract to do something, but the contract and the performance of the contract was molded to the actual needs of the Navy rather than the words of the contract. That's the best way I can say it. It was important that every phase of what we did was uh, practical to the Navy ensign uh, officer, whoever was going to be running it, fixing it, and repairing it. Uh, so that all of a sudden we would design something that was not only a technical, to technical specifications, but it was something that was going to have to work. And it proved out to be the, the truth. I fought it many times because I'm trying to live to the letter of the law, as the saying goes, and, and yet the important thing was to make it so that it could be used. And we broke a, a lot of barriers in doing that. And, and there was communication at every level between, from the guys that actually were going to be running it to the captains, admirals, and, and, and uh, ensigns that were in the, uh, the other side of the Navy and OR engineers. So there was a lot of communication between the two. I mean, in fact, I used to spend almost my whole day in communication with the Navy in one form or another. And then I'd spend the next hours from, from 5 to 12 to actually doing my work. And, uh, and uh, I think the results were, were, well, history will speak for that because I believe there's like 100 of those equivalent radar uh, systems. And uh, systems is a key word there, combat systems that were built since that time and are continuing to be built. And the other thing was that it was an integrated system. Um, matter of fact, it was such a, a, a change in the way the Navy did business. Um, in order, the Navy would buy a gun here and a ship here, a ship and a, and a radar and something else and something else, and they put it all together and they called it a fighting ship. This was, we were designing practically the whole ship so that it all worked together. Everything had to be matching, be able to match and mate, and whether it was the... Uh, the missiles, or whether it was the living quarters, or, or the, where the radar was situated, or uh, every aspect of it had to be worked out. And it, the theme of it being an integrated design uh, to the utmost was the thought. Now, what happened as a result of that? Uh, first of all, for RCA, as well as a lot of other subsidiary companies, it became a mainstay of their business for any number of years. And if you have that kind of a situation economically, that means it's a job, it's a living, it's a uh, economically, it, me it meant a great deal to a lot of people, not only engineers, in a lot of different places for any number of years after thereafter. So I'm, I'm real proud to have been a part of that mm -hmm. uh, development. You mentioned um, some intense communications at all levels. Is there any particular instance or story that stands out that would illustrate that? <laughs> well, 
I'm trying to think of some. There were so many. Um, I remember uh, the, we had a, uh, a consoles that made the for the, all the displays for the Aegis systems, and the admiral at that time was a captain wanted to have it uh, mocked up. Well, that was going to cost a lot of money to do, and I'm trying to project manage my part of the system there to not to spend any money, and we were verbally fight back and forth. And finally, the last phase of the discussion, when I was up in a presentation, I remember coming in with my carpenter's apron and, and a saw and a hammer hanging up. I said, I give up. I will make your mock-up. But uh, that was just a, a humorous, humorous situation. But we spent a lot of time in making presentations to one another. I mean, if, when they started building the ship, the shipyard was in there. The missile people were in there. The uh, so subs like Raytheon, who was building some of the subs, they were in there. We were constantly having meetings and talking and, and discussing and working out the detailed specifications uh, that would identify what we were doing and how it would interrelate with every other part. Uh, I don't know if that answers what you're it after. It does. Um, what about your peers? What was it like working with your peers? Well, um, It was, um, first of all, despite all those presentations and all the rest of it, and working with peers, it was pretty like an informal thing. We, uh, it wasn't Mr. Volpe, it was Joe, it, was, it wasn't Mr. Shipper, it was Larry. Uh, and uh, it, again, like I said, even if we disagreed or whatnot, it, it, it was able to uh, um, communicate. We, there were no barriers for communication. Um, I don't remember any uh, particular aspect of that. We, there always used to be a, a line between projects and, and design engineer. Well, one of the things that I, I did when I became as chief engineer is try to break down those barriers and, and get a, a, even a more meaningful dialogue going back and forth. So that was uh, okay. Um, I think that we were fortunate in, in, in that time of the of the period of the of uh, our all our lives is that the economy, the business economy was pretty good, especially during the Aegis time period, and uh, so that um, uh, it was a lot easier to do business and, and to work and without worrying. As the post Aegis era, things got a little tighter and tougher and very uh, competitive in the defense industry. Things started to get a little tougher then, and then you had to be a little more careful. And, uh, but still, even then, I would say up to the time that I stayed there when GE took over, it was a, I used to know and deal with the pricing people, the manufacturing people, the buying people, and all of us. And there was, it was a nice, as I said earlier, it was a fun time, uh, I, I think. Uh, more than anything. Yeah. In, the, <clears throat> in the context of Aegis, can you correlate that to the idea of the nations that was in the Cold War period? What did the Aegis do in that regard? Because it became one of the largest programs for the Navy, and the Navy had a significant impact on the Cold War. Well, I, I find it... I don't know, I, a little hard to respond to that, Joe, because uh, maybe I was being a, I'm a little myoptic at that time because I was, Cold War was there and it wasn't something I was focusing in on. I was more interested in that situation. But in, in reflection, more than anything was happening on, on the, at the time, uh, it, it was really... The, the conversion, the new navy, it made all the difference in the world as far as uh, the, art, the United States, particularly defense aspect. Because up to that time, I had the opportunity to go on some navy ships that were missile ships and uh, latest, so-called latest uh, technology, which were like antiques, if I can say it that way, because the technology we're seeing on this latest ships were like 10, 15 years old, and sometimes it would work. And the Aegis 
was exact opposite. I mean, it had to work, and it did work all the time. And it, as a result, I think it, it made the United States Navy uh, a most impressive thing that existed then and now to this day. Uh, very, very effective and, and uh, um, reliable. The, to give you a for instance of why that happened is that when we came down, when we were during the development phase of the uh, uh, radar, uh, well, of uh, that part of the system, which was done at Morristown, and we're ready to do a three-day uh, system test, which we've done on all radars. Uh, the good uh, captain said, okay, before you start, I want every cabinet banded up so you can't go in and twiddle. Now, to an engineer, that was like cutting his fingers off. I mean, it's unheard of. I almost pulled my hair out when I had red hair then, and we did it. And that just forced the issue. We had to make the equipment reliable and, and live up to this, those standards. I, I think as a result of that, thinking a little broader in the worldwide aspect, it, we gained respect as a nation, as a military power as well, because of this mobility of the Navy and this extremely accurate and, and uh, uh, important piece of equipment, which had a lot of firepower on it, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, it probably had a great influence on the actual uh, worldwide uh, appearance that the United States had at that time. Okay. Okay. Um, now, as things tightened up in Aegis, um, also with broadcast systems, um, there were layoffs. Now, you, as one of the movers and shakers, uh, what, what, how did you feel about that? What did you do with the layoffs when you were facing them? Well, of course, my, the major layoff I was involved in was with broadcast when we had to um, close it down. Mm -hmm. And I think at that time we had about 500, 550 employees or whatever. <coughs> matter of fact, I remember when I got the word I was in the process of doing my five-year strategic planning, which was, and I was told to shut down the division. Well, I, I, that was probably one of the more memorable uh, days of uh, my career because uh, I had to pass the word along to all the employees. And we had most of the employees right, uh, well, not too far from here, at the paintworks in Gibbsborough at that time where the broadcast division was stationed. So we gathered everybody there, probably had maybe 400 of the 500 and some odd people were available from the factory, from the engineering department. And uh, th this is what happened. I announced what we had to do. We had to close down the plant, et cetera, and tell them all the, everything we were going to try to do to get people placed and all the rest of it. And at the end of the, uh, my speech or presentation, I got a an outstanding bunch of clapping and cheers. I mean, and to me that was uh, <coughs> a, a very uh, memorable period because basically they all said, well, we know you're, you're, you're going to do what you can and you've done everything you can to protect our jobs and all the rest of it. And uh, we actually, we were very fortunate again because it was a good time. And we placed actually everybody except for the skeleton, skeleton crew that was remaining in other divisions of RCA. I think we, we, we actually laid off maybe five or ten people out of all that. And everybody, it took almost six months to get everybody placed. We got everybody placed, and, and that was really a wonderful aspect of life. My, I hadn't, didn't have any opportunities to go through many other layoffs during my rest of my career except for that one major one. We um, have heard from several people that we've interviewed uh, a term, the RCA family. <laughs> what does that mean to you? Well, it, it means what I said. It was fun to work there. Uh, and you did, <clears throat> you did feel as though you belonged. Um, where are you from? I'm from RCA. I mean, that was it. And uh, as you'll find out, RCA... I'm just thinking my little piece of it, but RCA as a larger community, particularly in the Camden, South Jersey area, uh, 
I've met so many people who have had some member of their, of their family working for RCA from back in the 20s, 30s, and 50s, 60s. And uh, so that it has, meant a, it has had a presence in this area, South Jersey area, for years and years. And, uh, but my own experience and the reason why I think of it as a family is that there were a lot of personal relations. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what it's like working in the corporate world nowadays, but I suspect from what I hear and see on the periphery here that it's not the same. Uh, it certainly wasn't the same when we were taken over by GE in that short period of time. But uh, it was always something that you could count on. It was there. Uh, there's no question about it. It's something of the past. I don't know that it exists anymore or that you, there is an equivalent. So much, it was such a shock that this family could be sold that uh, I think a lot of people, myself included, still don't believe it. <laughs> Do you believe that RCA changed South Jersey? Oh, well, I don't know if they changed it, but they, they were such a part of it that they, uh, how do I want to say, it? more than changing than they originated more. Uh, they were more uh, uh, a part of the beginning of it rather than the changing of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if you think about it, how many different places there were in Jersey particularly South Jersey, that you could still work at RCA and still be there. I mean, I, I worked in how many different places and I never had to move <laughs> over 25 years because I still worked for RCA. Um, when you have that many people, I think at one time there were at least 25,000 working back around the Second World War time frame, uh, it, it can't help, help but have a major impact on the the lives of so many people that uh, it's, it's sort of like uh, in the core there. Mm -hmm. It still is, I'm sure. Still running into people that say, oh yeah, you worked at RCA, yeah, yeah. And sooner or later, either their father or their uncle, and then we may have worked in the same place at one time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what was the worst thing about working for RCA? Hmm, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Uh, The worst thing. Hmm. Well, I'm a little nonplussed to try to think of that. Maybe I'll just think, I'll start by saying, I'll think of some of the worst things that happened to me, <laughs> and then maybe we can correlate them. As I mentioned earlier, I had the uh, an opportunity to start in the Aegis program. And what I didn't mention is that along with that um, change in position, it effectively promoted me to work for the general manager on his staff. So I was in, a manager in the Aegis uh, program, but I was working for the general manager who was Phil Pirro at the time. I, I felt real good, you know, as an individual here. All of a sudden, I, I've been fighting to become a manager, and now I'm up at the, right at the staff level. So I worked that for about a year or so, and all of a sudden I get a, a, a call, or well, actually I was told there was a reorganization in which they shuffled Aegis and, and the, the other part of Morristown, did it together, and instead of working for the general manager, now all of a sudden I was working about three levels below. Mm -hmm. Same job, everything the same, you know, same pay and all the rest, but still you're, you're, so you feel as though you've been demoted. So I was feeling pretty blue, and I get a call from Irv Kessler at that time, who was the vice president, whatever, in charge of all the uh, divisions of RCA at that time, of the uh, government divisions. And he wanted to console me and said, oh, Joe, I, I know this, you feel bad about the change in the reorganization. He says, but look, he says, I had my problems too. They just had a vote. I was hoping I was going to become on the board of RCA and they didn't vote me in. I said, oh, I feel so bad for you, you know. <laughs> but uh, that was not too bad. But that was one of my low points of my career that uh, bothered me. But it, it worked its way out. Uh, what's the worst thing about working for RCA? Hmm. I, I'm really hard-pressed 
to to think about the the bad parts of it. Uh, um, there are so many good uh, things that you can that I can relate, especially if I'm trying to convey the, the a message of what it was like there. That um, I, I don't really know how to answer you otherwise. Okay. And your coworkers, did you spend any time outside of work with them? Socialization. I'm oh, not a big socializer, as my wife could tell you, but. Um, Best answer is that probably not. I not, not as I remember, and <laughs> there's a very good reason for that because I spent all my free time at RCA. <laughs> oh, right. I mean, um, I remember being told that I had only spent had seven meals and seven months at home one, during one period of the Aegis program. So, um, I guess the only th times I remember being outside was in, in groups, which would be like Christmas parties. I, I used to enjoy the Christmas parties particularly. And uh, the thing I used to like about the Christmas parties, particularly when I, like when I became chief engineer, is that I would always sit not with the other managers, but with the other engineers, because that was my way, my the way I enjoyed it. I felt comfortable with them. Yeah. I knew as many cleaners and janitors as I knew vice presidents. <laughs> you mentioned before uh, playing bridge. Yeah. Was that with any co-workers? Well, uh, yes, now that you mention it, I forgot. That's how I learned to play bridge was at RCA, <laughs> at lunch. Lunchtime was a time when everybody would do something, play pinnacle, play bridge, or whatever they did, or go outside and do walk. But uh, my thing was playing bridge. As a matter of fact, we had a bridge group going for three or four years, and we kept a constant score going, and that was a, a good pastime. Mm -hmm. uh, had a lot of things like that. Um, so how would you sum up your career at RCA? Just a job or what? It was a, a life. It was a, it was a big slice of my life. Now you have family life and you have other things. Maybe you have, you're very strong at the hobbies or whatever. I wasn't at that time. <clears throat> It was a big part of my life. I spent more time in work than I did in any other thing of, during my uh, days or years that I spent at that time. Um, it, was a, it was a good life, too. Uh, it was a, a, a time that I would not want to trade for anything I can think of. Um, and it was varied enough and interesting enough that it kept me well, mentally uh, occupied. It was a, a good time of life. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm very glad to have had the opportunity to have lived that. That's about the best way I can say it. Well, this has been a really good time. Um, are there any other stories, instances, or anything that uh, popped into your head as we were talking before we finished? I don't think you have enough uh, video storage to get all that in there. The Emmys. <laughs> the Emmys? Yes, that was... Uh, I brought in one of the memorabilia was the uh, Emmys that we were awarded to the uh, broadcast division. And uh, th that was a, w a wonderful experience to go up and represent the division and the people and all their efforts, and, and so it's just like you, when an actor goes up there and he's, he's speaking for all the directors and all the costume makers and everybody that made it happen, he's their spokesman, and that's the way it was. When I got up there and was able to accept them for, the, for achievement, that was a wonderful experience. And the last, the very last one was when I was up there and was able, I had the opportunity to say effectively goodbye to the industry when we closed. Uh, broadcast. It was a wonderful feeling, a, a very emotional uh, uh, period. But again, it was with all these people. These these happened to be mostly non-RCA people from the whole broadcast community, and you, you really felt good to be a part of that. And that was a very good time. <laughs>